Hello, and welcome to another episode of Meet the Candidates. My name is Curtis Pamelia, and I'm your host for today. And I am joined with Sean McIntyre, one of the 17 candidates for the upcoming 2017 recall election for mayor for the city of Flint. Mr. McIntyre, thanks for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me, Curtis. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. It's <laughs> no. probably going to be a long, awkward dance here for the next 13 minutes. Or it's going to be wonderful. Don't <laughs> worry about it. Um, so why don't we start by you just telling us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to run for mayor. Um, okay, so I moved here in uh, 2003 from San Diego. I met my wife there. Uh, and when I moved here, I took a job at Starbucks, worked there for seven years, um, took a job with, at the time was Piranha Arena, worked there for another couple years. Uh, and right now I am a stay-at-home dad, I am a soccer dad, I am a citizen activist, uh, I am not corrupt. And that's really leading into why I chose to uh, run for the office of mayor. Uh, Flint has had a problem over the last several years. Uh, 20 really uh, with recall they want to vote a mayor in and then they want to recall it a couple years later um, that is costing everybody money uh, and it's kind of frustrating because nobody ever really gets an opportunity to get started with uh, getting getting some things going to, to kind of rebring this city back to its uh, glory days uh, so when I when the opportunity came to run for mayor, uh, it was kind of a, a random thing. I, I saw a friend of a uh, message from a friend of mine on Facebook, who said, um, "Hey, there! If you want to run for mayor, um, the deadline is Monday, and it's a hundred dollars or forty signatures." And I started thinking to myself, you know, if if the bar is that low to run for mayor, um, a there's going to be a whole bunch of people coming to do it, and b uh, I want to make sure that if there's somebody on the ballot that I know that they're honest, they have integrity, and uh, they're not corrupt. And so I thought, all right, let's uh, let's do this. Kind of half as a uh, if I could do it, and half for the story of hey, remember a couple years ago when I ran for mayor? Yeah, ha, that was kind of funny. But then as I got more into it, um, I started going out and trying to get signatures from people, and having conversations with people but the deadline came up really fast so I, I, I hatched a plan that I would raise the hundred dollars because what I had seen is uh, I had seen um, people giving interviews and talking about how and one of the questions that came up with uh, did you just pay the hundred dollars did you actually go out into the public and see if there's actually people who want to support mm -hmm. you for yeah. this so given the short time frame and having those conversations, I was running into problems where I didn't want to get into a position where I got 40 signatures and then uh, when they were certified, I, I came up short. So I hatched a, a plan to uh, paint 100 rocks. So I got my kids together, we, we went to the dollar store and I bought 100 rocks, just little rocks. There's a, a movement right now where people are painting rocks and just kind of hiding them around uh, just to to give people some joy like if you're walking into Applebee's and you look down and there's a painted rock with googly eyes it's like hey you're gonna have a good day so I, I painted a hundred rocks and I went to art walk on a Friday um, in August and I, I set up a table and said hey I'm running for mayor I want to have conversations with people taking donations for a dollar for a rock to raise a hundred dollars and I talked to close to 200 people um, from what we can kind of gather raise a hundred dollar filing fee and boom, I'm on the ballot for mayor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm running on the no corrupt, no ego party platform, so to speak. So I wanted to give me and anybody else who wants to vote for somebody an option that they know that they're honest and they're not corrupt. So it's good. that's a long... That's no, a long, it's, it's, it's plenty. It really <laughs> gives the viewers context on who you are and where you're coming from. Okay. So um, on this issue of being an uncorrupt candidate, what does that allow you to do differently? What issues would you focus on? What steps would you take that would be different from kind of the allowable box of political action that maybe other operatives downtown, you know, work under? What that, what that means to me is, and I joke, I don't have enough power, money, or influence in order to be corrupt. Right. So, um, okay. What I see is... Uh, Flint, and this is going to be in the larger picture of, of um, the movers and the shakers in this town, the, the, the people who do have the money, power, and influence, the, the people that are um, on the city council and 
uh, decision makers that affect um, uh, people's lives in this city, like uh, like on a large scale, not just on a small scale. Mm -hmm. um, what I want, uh, what I want for that is, um, I want people to be able to understand that this community that we have, uh, everybody's done group projects in school, and, that, and that's kind of how I. And it's a really simplistic. Uh, idea but you've done a group project in school and, and you have the people that are really motivated to get that get that done and you have the people that are kind of slacking I, I see this community and, and particularly uh, the mayor and the city council is like the group project and nobody's getting along because there's a lot of ego involved there's um, a lot of self-preservation and uh, self um, motivation to not necessarily help the community at large um, you hear a lot of these candidates and a lot of these people talk about, well, I'm going to do for Flint. Well, Flint isn't a person. The residents of Flint are what you should be talking about. And when you say that I'm going to do for Flint, to me that tells me that you're going to do for the, the entity of Flint, but not as the residents as a whole. So mm -hmm. what I really want to focus on is being able to go out and have uh, the community feel like their voices are heard. Uh, this leads into another thing you, you see in city council meetings that so much time is, is taken up with, with residents who want to go up and, and use their three minutes mm -hmm. to talk about what the things that are important to them. That's awesome. I really want to hear what those things are. The city council isn't necessarily the best place to be able to get yourself heard. Uh, if I'm elected, uh, I want to be able to have those conversations in a time when people can have the time and feel like they're being listened to. I want to, I, this is my years of customer service. Customers want to be heard. They want to feel like even if you're going to tell them no, at least you listened to what it was that they were asking you and you came to some sort of an agreement on what was going to be beneficial for both the parties involved. And I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I'm for the people, by the people, uh, because that should be understood. I, I am. But I want to give the people who are willing to put themselves out there an opportunity to have those long, involved conversations and, and be able to let them feel like, hey, somebody's listening to me. And then when we go to the city council meeting, when we're deciding on this, all that legwork and all that back work has been done. And we can actually use the city council in an open forum, not these closed forum situations that we have, where all the, the secret deals are being done behind the back and nobody knows what's going on. Um, I want to be able to you know, address those things. I want the city council to be more in contact with, uh, with the constituents and their things. I want the ombudsman that's being used, uh, that's, that the new charter talked about reinstating, to, to go in and um, be able to hold these people accountable so that they're not just going and doing and saying whatever is in their own best interest mm -hmm. they're actually being held accountable to the residents that they are supposed to represent and, and what do you think are some of the things if residents voices were heard more i mean you, yourself uh, as a resident you said you've been doing some conversations you've right. obviously lived here what do you think are the things that people want to say that are you know systematically not heard. What kinds of problems? What kinds of just perspectives? Whatever. That kind of goes in line with the question that I've been get, that that all of the candidates kind of get a lot. Um, what are the five things? You know, what are your five issues that you mm -hmm. you're sure with sure? Parents? I mean, that's kind of a standard issue with yeah. with all the other um, uh, print interviews and, and I think and, and that's a legitimate thing. And so it's like you know I can sit here and rattle off corruption, uh, water, crime, blight. And poverty. Mm -hmm. um, I don't put that. I don't put poverty at the at the end of the line. I put poverty as the underlying current in everything. Mm -hmm. um, all of the uh, the event chain of problems. And when I say event chain, I mean that that Flint's issues didn't come because of one thing. All right, the water was uh, was kind of like the final domino in a decades long event chain of, of destruction. Um, I liken it to the analogy of planes crash. They don't crash because of one thing. They crash because of a series of 10, 11 events all in a row that you mm -hmm. don't ever recover. Any one of those 10 or 11 events you're able to absorb at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but Flint's, Flint's have been going on for decades. Uh, I would say probably when GM officially kind of 
pulled out the majority of the factory. And it's been just kind of systematically going through. And then the result is the water happening. You know, it's cut, 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 cut. And then all of a sudden there's nothing left it, you know it's kind of like that game of like don't break the ice you, know, you take out a little piece and you take out another little piece and you keep taking you see how many pieces you can take out before the whole thing collapses well the water thing was when the whole thing collapsed at that point mm -hmm. so these conversations that i've had with people to kind of get back to that um those are the f the, the top five things that people talk about um i think uh, poverty being the number one underlying factor of that if people are worried if they have um uh they're worried about their where their next meal is going to come from they're worried about if their power is going to get turned off they're worried about if their kids are going to get to school on time they don't have time to worry about the intricacies of 83 pages of a charter they're worried about their immediate needs being met um, and poverty is doing that and then from poverty then that leads to corruption that leads to uh, crime that leads to blight that leads to all of these other things so in order to truly fix Flint's problem if you, if there was a magic button that you could push to fix poverty a you'd probably get a Pulitzer Prize not a Pulitzer Prize it's not a Pulitzer Prize mm -hmm. um uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel Peace Prize. That's that's <laughs> okay. what I'm kind of going through all of the prizes in my mind right sure. there. Um, you you get a Nobel Peace Prize, but what I do know from the studies that I've seen, poverty is dealt with again by reversing those dominoes, one little step at a time, incrementally, mm -hmm. incrementally. Um, there's the uh, the old Aesop's tale about the about the crow that wanted to get a drink of water in the jar, but it couldn't fit its head in. So it systematically started dropping pebbles in until it filled the water up tall enough for it to be able to get a drink. That's what we need to do with Flint. We need to systematically start dropping pebbles in and metaphorically with the water, I, I get. I don't think that that isn't lost on me also. But to rise the entire community all at the same time, it, that's the only way that poverty is gonna get fixed. And then these other things are gonna take care of themselves. There's not gonna be motivation for crime. Or if there is, there are one offs that you can deal with. There isn't going to be issues with blight. Why? Because we went after the land bank and we started making single home uh, owners in this town as opposed to multiple home owners. We're going to um, we're going to solve the water crisis because we're not going to address just where the water's coming from. We're going to address the affordability versus assistance problem. Um, which is the thing that nobody wants to talk about or that people aren't really talking about all that much. So, I mean, that's just a few of the things that I've, I've kind of talked yeah, about. Yeah. Uh, well, we do have to go to a short break, uh, but we will continue our conversation on some of these many issues, especially that you just raised right at the end, mm -hmm. about reversing the cycle of poverty in Flint when we get back. So stay tuned. Toughest guy on earth. He does the work of two jobs, but only gets paid for one. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Hello and welcome back to Meet the Candidates. I'm here with Sean McIntyre, mayoral candidate for the city of Flint. Uh, early on, before the break, you were talking a lot about two things. One, um, reversing the cycle of poverty in Flint, and two, creating opportunities for democratic participation in the city. Uh, I'd imagine to address both of those would have to involve on some level taking on PA 436, the emergency management law. Right. Um, 
I'm glad you said it out loud because a lot of people don't know what PA four is. I feel like that's the Aleppo question of uh, uh, candidates. Like, uh, uh, how do you feel about PA? Name name instance? one name one for right. and, yeah exactly. yeah um, so. I guess my, my questions are twofold. Uh, well, let me just ask it this way. What can what capacity does the mayor have to do anything about the emergency management law? I mean, how, how would how what approach do you take towards reversing Okay. That my law? understanding of PA four thirty six, which by the way I would like to say is the um, uh, I was gonna tell you a joke right now. It, it's the worst sequel ever, actually, to PA four. <laughs> And for some reason, there's 432 other PAs in between there that I'm not sure if they were, they threw them out. But yeah, that went over well. Um, PA 436. All right, from what I understand, uh, the changes in, from PA 4, 436, uh, it gives um, the, the legislative or school districts in whatever community that it does, it gives them the opportunity to vote uh, to get rid of the emergency manager after 18 months of mm -hmm. that. How I understand the state has been able to get around that is they insert an emergency manager and then at like 16 months they pull that assert emergency manager and then they put in a new one and then they claim that well no it's not actually been 18 months. Interesting. Um, Again, I, I'm not entirely sure of that, but that's been my understanding. Uh, the other thing that they did was uh, when they when they upgraded it from from Public Act Four was uh, they gave um, it, Public Act Four allowed the voters to be able to vote out whether we were going to even have an emergency manager, and they put a provision in there to make it illegal for the residents of Michigan, of the state of Michigan to enact any kind of legislation that would get rid of the emergency. Yeah, the law can no longer be repealed, right. by, a be repealed by a popular right. referendum. Right, right. So to get back to um, what you were talking about with... What can be done? What, can what be would done? you do as mayor, basically? Well, we need to do... All right, well... We need to, to, to wrest back control of our city from the state. Uh, we haven't been very successful with lawsuits with that. Um, we need to hold Snyder accountable and all of his people, which we're slowly starting to do um, with these two, last week, these two uh, court cases mm -hmm. that are being held over and saying that, yeah, we can go ahead and, and file lawsuits against these people for mm -hmm. uh, murder, essentially. I mean, it's a degree of murder. It's not murder one, but um, mm -hmm. we need to keep on that. We need to... to to, to do that, we need to make uh, use whatever means necessary it, within our legal control to be able to make hold the people that did this accountable to make Flint whole again. Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily. Uh, I don't necessarily have uh, great knowledge right now, being that I don't have access to all of the documents and and all of the resources. Uh, being just a candidate, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that um, I do. I am very resourceful, and uh, if I were to be elected mayor, that I would definitely go after everything possible. And not only that, but I would be um, putting that information out into the community so the the community knew exactly what's going on. Uh, you know, one of the things that with current Mayor Weaver, I think that if if she would have just done simple public relations, some simple customer service type of stuff like, hey, it's, you know, put out a tweet. It's day 1027 and we still don't have clean water. It's still going to hold. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of little gestures would have gone a long way with people and, and we probably wouldn't have a recall effort because of it. Mm -hmm. But instead, when she got in, she just kind of hunkered down like all the rest and just started going into self-preservation mode. Mm -hmm. um, so my biggest thing is is I want everybody in this who lives who's a, a, a Flint resident to have access to be able to know what the inner workings are, what's going on, and what are these decisions being made, and how does it affect them directly? Again, I know it's hard because two thirds of the city, sixty five thousand people, are live under the poverty line, my family included. Um, it's hard to be a 
uh, well-versed citizen in this community because as I mentioned before you're worried about is my car my car just broke down how am right. I gonna get it fixed if right. I don't get it fixed I'm gonna go to, I'm not gonna be able to go to work I'm gonna lose my job and you know it's just again these other little domino effects of poverty on a smaller scale with each individual family so to kind of circle back around yeah it's uh, I'm not entirely sure what is legally available to me but I, right. I, I, I you can rest assured that I will t- I will go out into the public and say all of this yeah stuff. just maintaining a direct dialogue about what you're encountering that's uh, in a way that you feel like I mean it's like and, and it's like you know I mean it used to be a few years ago it used to be the internet and, and, and online online access was not available to people but it seems like so many people have the ability to have a so be on social media I mean mm-hmm. to, to get their news from anything other than a television station right um, believe me, I ran into the television station people only like when I was out talking to people. It amazes me that, like, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. I, I, at the very least, make the whole city give connectivity to the whole city. I mean, that's not anything my platform, but I see the advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. Giving everybody the opportunity. I mean, the, the internet and, and being online is so um, important in disseminating information. And I mean, it's like earlier today there was a really warm wind and you know there's a chance of a tornado we don't have cable television and that's really the only time that i ever got you know yeah. tornado warnings so the internet needs to be i mean this is all of this information needs to to get out there and and give people the access to be able to then they can decide whether they want to pursue it and find it or not but at least give them a simple place to be able to find all of this stuff. I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you about Mayor Weaver's uh, kind of grand bargain that she struck uh, on the new water sourcing uh, for Flint between Gliwa and um, the KWA. There's been on, you know, there's been a lack of agreement between city council and the mayor over that plan. Um, How do you feel about the proposal? I guess would be question number one. There's a lot of, it goes back, there's a lot of ego involved. Mm -hmm. You you have the two camps. You have the GLWA camp, you have the KWA camp. Mm -hmm. Um, Neither side is talking about affordability Mm -hmm. versus assistance. And honestly, and what, just for our viewers who might not know, okay. what's the distinction between assistance versus affordability? Okay. So right now we have, you know, it's, everybody knows this, it's been widely publicized. We have arguably, if not the highest water rates in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and people are getting shut off notices. So they're, they're, they're being served a bad product and getting served shut off notices. Right. Um, in uh, stopgap measure happened is you have you give okay so your bill is 160 dollars a month on average um what we'll do is we'll give you credits uh to knock that bill down to 120 dollars right all right well to like sorry we gave you lead infested water here's 40 bucks um that's really great for a short short term it helps people in the immediate short term but nobody's talking about the fact that your bill is 160 bucks anyway, and it became 160 dollars because in 2011, with uh, Mayor Wallen at the time signing agreements like, "Hey, we're going to try to balance our budget by raising everybody's water rates, and mm-hmm. we're going to do an, an an illegal move of balancing our budget on utilities." And I don't understand why that hasn't been rolled back yet. I haven't been able to figure out who's in charge of rolling back. <laughs> the the water rates it seems like whenever you get someplace they say no so and so is there no mm-hmm. it has to come from the council no it has mm-hmm. to come from uh, the emergency manager no it has to come from we have to get uh, the plant uh, has to get inspected and so the state has to get inspectors in there there's just a lot of you know who's it I don't know where it's coming from but yeah well and part of the issue as you just mentioned is you know, the water rates are financing so much of the general administration of the city that what right. happens when you lower the water rates is a question. Well, when you lower the water rates, what happens then is you, you get yourself in a position where um, people are going to say, or, or people will say, is your budget is going down, like your yearly budget. Mm-hmm. Um, my understanding of where a lot of the revenue, if not, you know, 100% of the revenue comes from property taxes. Okay, so we have, you know, upwards of 60 70 percent of properties in this town owned by the land bank 
that aren't paying property taxes. So that goes back to creating single home owners to decide, and, and that kind of goes into one of the other things that, that if I were to get into this administration, I would really pursue, pursue what I call a works program. So we would divide, uh, we would figure out in the city, uh, we would get grants, get, um, uh, move the budget around, although I'm not entirely sure where the money, and mostly grants to clean up the city. So we'll go into the, we'll, we'll assess the properties that are owned by the land bank We'll determine if they need to be demolished or if uh, they just need to be cleaned up with some repairs and then we'll give them to people essentially or, or sell them for a, a dollar a square foot to people. Uh, we need to get homeowners in the city. Mm -hmm. Homeowners are going to uh, create the stable base of a safe uh, place to live which then starts to alleviate the poverty and get people from buying in from home, home ownership. That's going to stop the poverty cycle. Uh, it's going to hopefully stop the crime cycle. Um, so to kind of circle back around to is Gliwa versus KWA better? But it doesn't matter where we get our water from if the pipes that the water's coming through is bad. So yeah, I'm one of the houses that's actually got its water pipes. Um, Goyette came through last week. The service lines. The service yeah. lines fixed. Um, does it, I mean, still got uh, rusted out galvanized in my house, still got leached right, out right. copper in my house, and I'm not the only house, you know? I mean, my water heater still got stuff in it. Uh, it, it doesn't matter where, the, I guess, it doesn't matter where the water comes from if where it's, what is being serviced right. through is still dirty, right. and it doesn't matter if you can't afford it. Um, we need to, GWA, or GLWA or KWA, we need to. We can't go 30 years and not own anything. At the mm -hmm. end. We gotta own. We have to own something at the end. But we can't just be a 30-year-long renter paying high rates. So, whatever plan I come up, uh, I would uh, go and and I've been working with, uh, or I've been talking to, to Claire McClinton from Two Years Too Long, and uh, actually Paul Herring came up with a couple good ideas, and and there were like nine ideas that, that were seemed like feasible ideas. But it shouldn't just come from one person. It should come from the community because the community is going to be the one that's footing the bill. So I believe they need to have a say in where their water is coming from. It's uh, it's up to the city council and the mayor's office to listen to what the people have to say and then ha uh, hopefully act on that accordingly. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah. So that is all the time we have for today. Uh, but thanks a lot for coming in. I feel like there's a lot more we could have talked about if we had more time. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, it was really good hearing your thoughts. And um, stay tuned for our viewers because we will be back with more interviews with both up, uh, candidates for the upcoming mayor race in addition to the city council races for the 2017 election. So stay tuned. Thanks. Your mics are clear. Okay. the toughest guy on earth. He does the work of two jobs, but only gets paid for one. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving.